Are you having trouble getting any traction in your self-publishing business? Do you want to know how to reach your audience but not sure where to start? Then today's guest is going to share how to write a book custom made for your ideal audience. Stay tuned. Welcome to Sub Publishing with Dale. And if you want tips and strategies for publishing your own books, then make sure you subscribe and turn your notifications on to get all my latest videos. Today's guest is prolific author and fellow YouTube personality, Chris Fox. He's the best selling author of 5,000 words per hour, right to market, and numerous science fiction, fantasy, and thriller novels. Every week, he releases a video for authors on YouTube discussing a variety of aspects in the self publishing business, including writing, marketing, and motivation. For the past few years, Chris has successfully etched his name into different niches under his own name, and he documents his trials and tribulations in his Write Faster, Write Smarter book series. You don't have to go far when doing your research in the business of self-publishing before you trip over an interview, podcast, or conference with Chris Fox in it. So I consider myself fortunate to rope him in for a few words on self-publishing, writing, and beyond. Welcoming to the show, Chris Fox. What's shaking? How you feeling, man? Hey, feeling great. Today is launch day for me. Uh, Voidworm, one of my, my novels just came out, so uh, it's been a really good day so far. Yeah, I was talking with Tim Knox earlier today. I think you know Tim, right? I do. Mm -hmm. he, he actually had mentioned, he goes, he's launching something today. You know that, right? And I was like, oh my gosh. And he's taking time. So I, I am even more uh, honored that you really took some time because I know that launch day is just nothing to joke about. You know, it's not, but most of the work is done ahead of time. So if you get to launch day and you've still got a bunch of stuff to do, generally you're in trouble. Hey, this is a little bit off script. Uh, do you, when you're getting ready to launch your books, do you take advantage of doing pre-orders at all? I do. Um, and, and it varies from book to book, and, and it depends on whether or not it's the first one in a series or, or a sequel. Um, but in this case, yes, I did. I had the full pre-order period, so 60 days um, from the launch of the previous book. Uh, I accumulated something like 1,300 pre-orders, and I really wanted maximum visibility, so that was the point behind that. But the question is, is it going to hurt launch day momentum? And so far, it looks like it's not. Nice. Well, congrats. That's awesome. 1,300. How long a period did, uh, did you have that pre-order set? So just over two months. I put it up the day after the first book went live. Tremendous. Uh, and when you do set up these pre-orders, um, typically, what is your strategy going into that? Do you just kind of put it up there and contact your email list and hope for the best? Um, I don't even contact my pre-order list, so I do what, what I would call a quiet pre-order. I put okay. it up there so that if you're really interested in buying through and getting the second book, you can, and then I'm not losing that sale. But I try not to tell the list or tell most people so that they don't buy it immediately, so that when I can reach those people through my list um, on launch day, I get the sale right then and there. I get credit for it, and it helps the rank of the book. For your pre-order, I typically myself, and please correct me if I'm wrong at all, I typically drop down the price to kind of entice the buy. Is that a strategy that you would use per se, or is that something that you don't necessarily need since you're more of an established author? I think it's highly dependent on your brand and on the genre that you're writing in. If you're doing nonfiction, then there's, there's probably never a reason to launch at anything but full price because people were going to pay whatever it takes to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, with fiction in a highly competitive genre, if it's the first book in series, I do still discount it. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's a sequel, I always launch it at full price. Wow. wow. Okay. See, I'm getting a lot of stuff. I'm sorry. I did. I'm getting way off the script, but it's just, we're just kind of just, you know, rolling with it. We're just, just kind of doing what we can here. So, uh, all right. So the, the thing that really attracts me so much about what you're doing is something along the lines that I've been doing, which is kind of building a little bit of a dual brand underneath the same umbrella of our own personal name. So for instance, I'm working heavily in the fitness brand and I haven't so much launched anything in self-publishing on self-publishing per se, but I imagine that's going to be somewhere down the pipeline. How do you do it? Because you have managed to create two separate brands underneath one roof. There, you know, there's definitely, a, I guess, an efficiency to doing two different brands and having them feed into each other. I only have to run the one website, for example, which is great, but it also muddies things a lot, mm -hmm. especially where Amazon's algorithms are concerned. So when I'm selling books, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes you'll see writing books in my also bots, which is never a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and something that I would like to avoid where possible. But 
I don't know. I think it's worth it. I, I do think that you can run multiple brands under the same author name. I think you can run them effectively. And, and I think the key is just being open with each group of people that you communicate with. So I've mm. sub set up my, uh, my mailing list so that I have a different list for every single conceivable interest. I've got one for nonfiction. Mm. I've got one for my post-apocalyptic. I've got one for my science fiction. I've got another one for space fantasy. And so I, I segment it really well. And I think that makes it easier to, to juggle both brands. Wow. So it's even more so than I had thought, because I was thinking, you know, you just separated fiction and nonfiction, but you separate down the fiction into many other sub niches. Right. And sometimes I'll send an email that'll hit all of those sub niches so I can choose to let them know. Like today, when I um, put a new book out, I let everybody know. I, I thought everybody on the fiction list, at least, would be interested in this series. They responded really well to Tech Mage, the first book in the series. So I felt safe doing that. But I have probably 4,000 nonfiction people on my list and I didn't tell them anything about it because you know, the last thing in the world that I want is 4,000 authors running out and, and buying this book and, and kind of destroying the algorithmic momentum that I've already earned. Makes sense, makes sense. So, uh, wow, uh, let's go ahead and get ourselves on track here. I, I've just started riffing off some of these questions. So I wanna kind of start it out. I've thrown out a word that I've used so many times on this channel, but I've never really defined it. So I think you're the perfect person to help me define this. What does branding mean to you? And can an author function without it? Uh, a brand is, and I'm going to try and go a little into neuroscience here, but still keep it, you know, uh, um, understandable. Okay. A, a brand is symbolic recognition for your brain. So when you see a Coca-Cola symbol or an AT&T symbol or any number of successful brands, you have an immediate set of emotional responses and memories based on how you've interacted with that brand throughout your life. And it's the same way as an author. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be just a visual representation. It's whatever you think of in relation to that brand. So one of my favorite authors, he's one of the largest fantasy authors in the, in the world currently, Brandon Sanderson. I, I can't think of a visual representation of him, but his brand is amazing. He's got a whole bunch of different novels across a, a variety of genres. And all of his fans will go from book to book to book to book. They'll go to sci-fi to, to, you know, um, to fantasy, to whatever he writes because of that brand. Now, can an author survive without that brand? Uh, I think so, but I think you'll lose a lot of momentum because mm -hmm. if you've got that brand, every time you release a book, then people know kind of where and how to find you and sort of what to expect. It's building on what, you, what has come before and kind of adding momentum. But if you don't have that author brand, let's say every set of covers looks different from series to series, mm -hmm. then people don't really know how to follow you. There's no cohesion. Um, they don't have the same set of emotional responses that you do when you see a Nike logo. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, how do you think it is that, uh, say for instance, someone like a Stephen King or say a um, Mike uh, Patterson, uh, help me out here, James Patterson. Uh, how do you think they're able to function? Because I, I know that sometimes over the years, I've seen a lot of their covers completely change. We're talking about people that have become iconic. So they okay. are um, almost intellectual property in and of themselves, belonging mm. to their agents and the companies that they publish books through. So those companies have done a lot to further their brand and they've had such large successes, like in the case of Stephen King, We've known who he was for 40 years, yeah. and everybody has their own vision of this. So maybe the first book that you found for Stephen King was Misery, maybe it was The Shining, maybe it was The Stand. So what you think of, of Stephen King is gonna vary from person to person, mm -hmm. but all of us were pulled in from one specific book, and I, I think that's true for Patterson as well, to the yeah. point where now he's doing a ton of co-authoring, where he'll co-author with you know a dozen different authors at a time, just yeah. because knowing that putting his name on the cover is gonna make people have that emotional response and, and buy. Yeah, excellent. I, I'm glad to kind of get that one clarified. Wh what do you recommend to self-publishing newbies when they want to get into this business and publish, say, under multiple niches? Is it possible to do that starting out? You know, it is, but the question is how fast do you write? And, and you really have to ask yourself what your goal is. If okay. you can write fast enough, then you can build multiple brands at the same time, but you're going to sacrifice some momentum in doing so. If you pull it off successfully in the long term, you're going to have you know, multiple brands thriving, which can make it worthwhile. But my, my best advice, I think, for a new author is resist the temptation to go in multiple directions at the same time. Double down on your favorite genre, pour everything you have into that and try and get as much momentum as possible. And then when you're a success there, then you can add a second brand and a kind of a second genre that you're branching into. But 
you know, I, I've written in four or five genres at a time and, and I sacrifice a lot of momentum doing that. So I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I imagine it probably can drive you to drink eventually. <laughs> you know, actually, it was, it, this brings up a pretty good point uh, about how fast you can write. And this was the, my introduction to you as, as a writer in nonfiction was the 5,000 words per hour, which is absolutely stellar to get to that point. And see, I've probably been loosely writing, I would say, really doing it for the past few years. And, you know, on a good day, I can probably crank out two to 3,000 within an hour. But when I saw that, I'm like, 5,000 per hour? Is this guy crazy? This has got to be a scam. So, of course, I read it. it. So, give me a little bit of synopsis. And, by the way, folks, it's not a scam. <laughs> There's a good reason why he laughed. Um, so, give me a little bit of a synopsis on, you know, what are writing sprints and is it really possible for a person to go 5,000 words per hour? If so, how soon can someone achieve something like that? You know, it really has to do with how your journey has gone as a writer. Like how fast of a typer are you currently? How many words are you doing currently to yeah. get to that 5,000? The easiest way to do it is to do voice dictation. That's the big cheat because we type mm -hmm. typically, you know, 80 words a minute is really, really good for somebody, which is about 5,000 words per hour. Yeah. But we speak at 150 words per minute. So you can go much, much faster if you are speaking, you're dictating your words, and you can get, you know, 5,000 words an hour is easy if you're doing it that way. Um, there's an adjustment period, it's definitely not easy to dictate. And if you find that you can't dictate, there's other ways to get your, your writing speed up. You, you asked what a writing sprint is. It, the idea is you're trying to get into flow state, and the way you do that is you block out all distractions, yeah. and you turn off the part of your brain that is analyzing. So you're just left with creativity. And you do this by not allowing yourself to go back and edit. So normally when you're writing, we'll, we'll write like two or three sentences and then we'll stop. And we'll go back and we'll start looking at those sentences and working on the prose. Instead, you, you make a deal with yourself. You're gonna come back later and you are going to do that work. But your goal is to finish a whole draft and do it in flow state. So you'll set a timer for let's say 20 minutes. And then for that 20 minutes, you do nothing but write. The clock is going, maybe some music is playing in the background, your email is turned off, your phone is turned off, you're just trying to make sure you do nothing but write. And your brain will learn that it's supposed to get into flow state when you're doing that. And the more you do this, the more you practice it, the faster you get. And, and I find and most people within a few weeks of adopting this process are up to about 3,000 words an hour. It seems like that's the really achievable milestone that most authors hit fairly quickly. Yeah, excellent. This is really good advice. If I seem to be jumping all over the map, I apologize. Um, there's, there's so many things I have to ask and obviously too little time. Um, so what do you think have been the key factors to the success of your brand? Um, let's go ahead and address your fiction brand as well as your nonfiction brand separately. So for the fiction brand, my success is looking around and trying to find genres where I know there's a large audience. Mm -hmm. The first series that I wrote, I sort of did this accidentally. I hit post-apocalyptic fiction and it turned out there's a lot of people who love zombies. So yeah. first series did okay. And I looked at it and I kind of said, well, how can I do intentionally what I had done accidentally? So I started buying some of the top selling books in genres that I liked. I read mm -hmm. those books. I looked at the things that they did in common. And then I realized that if I write something in roughly the same similar vein, then that I could go ahead and have similar success. And, and that was what, uh, what I ended up doing. Tremendous. And then what about your nonfiction brand? Nonfiction brand, um, I, I think the key is just honesty and transparency. Mm -hmm. So when I screw up, I admit it. Um, when I have a problem, I admit it. Uh, when I have you know, income at the end of the year, I'll actually break it all down and I'll show people exactly how much money I made and where it all came from. And, I think that transparency, that um, willingness to admit that I've made mistakes has done a lot to further the brand. So I, I do this sort of as a hobby. I don't make a ton of money from nonfiction. Um, and so there's no stress there. There's no need to promote it. There's no need for me to, to really push it or get marky with it. And I, I think that's why it's done as well as it has because people know I don't have an agenda. Yeah, I've noticed uh, that you've been, uh, you've had your YouTube channel up for probably what the past few years now and you have hundreds of videos lots and uh, uh, yeah that's, that takes a lot of work so how do you have time to sit down and write for your respective brands and then of course produce these videos because I'm gonna tell you video productions is not for sissies <laughs> <laughs> well I, I believe very firmly that for us to achieve everything that we want to achieve we, we need help I can't do it myself so the first thing that I did 
is hire a video editor and she does everything except for obviously the take I do myself. So yeah. I'll do in two or three takes um, a video each week and sometimes one take and then I just turn over the footage to her. So it probably only takes me a half hour to an hour each week to maintain my channel and she does the rest. Otherwise, I doubt I could do it just because I mean, there is so much to do with the writing. Yeah, it certainly is. It can be very time consuming. I just I noticed that your, your videos are definitely well put together. So you've you've kind of helped demystify it for me because I was like, man, how's this guy ever sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I work a lot, but most of it is just I've hired help. <laughs> That's all. Is there any other aspects where you find yourself having to hire out? Um, you know, for instance, obviously the given will probably be hiring out for an editor. Um, what are other areas that you have to hire out within your business so that that way you're not eating up a lot of time? The cover design is the number one. I mean, you might be able to do a cover yourself, but can you do the best cover in the world? And if not, you know, find find somebody who can and pay them to do it for you. So yeah. cover design. Um, any sort of, you know, lining up blog tours or managing mailing lists or anything that you can't, you know, that you, you shouldn't be focusing on because you should be writing. So the, the, anything that can be outsourced to somebody else and they can do it just as well as you can, I do. Um, mm -hmm. Proofing audiobooks is the number one thing I love getting off my plate. I hate mm -hmm. proofing audiobooks because you have to sit there with a pen and you're just listening to, you know, a 12 hour audiobook <laughs> for the five typos that happen to be there. So outsourcing that, um, I, I try to get everything off my plate that I possibly can and only focus on the writing and the business related tasks. And that's led to me kind of being too aggressive at times where I'll off, mm. you know, outsource stuff and it, it'll go poorly. Um, I outsourced my advertising for a little while and the person that I outsourced it to was kind of doing it in a vacuum and didn't necessarily have the experience necessary to manage those ads. And so she did the best that she possibly could, but the ad started losing money. And because I wasn't paying attention, it went on for months and it cost me quite a bit, pretty penny. So I've learned to be careful what I outsource, but I try to outsource everything that I feel reasonably that I can. That's, that's a really, really good take home. And it also reveals a little bit more about how you're saying you're very transparent and honest about some of the mistakes that you have. Uh, so this is a perfect time to segue into, uh, in your, book relaunch your novel love it by the way you shared how you missed the mark with your ideal audience in the deathless series and had to make adjustments later when do you know when a book is a stud or a dud i mean so like for instance when you got to adjust repackaging pricing book description things like that if you're in kindle unlimited and you are able to do a little bit of promotion very early on in a book you should know in a week or less how that okay. book's going to do. And I'm going to take a lot of flack for this. A lot of people are going to be like, oh, that's not soon enough to know. Uh, it, it can be if you understand how the algorithms are working and if you're used to seeing them work in a certain way. So when I launched my novel Behind the Lines this year, I watched the algorithms not catch. And I knew by the end of day three that this book was not going to perform very well. And, and it did okay. I made a profit. Yeah. But with Tech Mage, I knew within three days that this book was going to soar and outsell every book I'd ever published. Sure enough, it did because you can watch the momentum. I mean, all you have to do is track your sales graphs and you can see it start winging its way upwards. So you know very, very quickly, I think, whether or not a book is gonna be a success. Nice, and what do you think is the very first thing that you're going to focus on to hopefully adjust that and get it to where it's, you know, course correcting, if you will? I think uh, you need to look at it holistically. So you need to understand what audience you were trying to, to nail to get your book in front of. Yeah. And then figure out why you failed. Do that analysis where is it your cover? Is it your description? Is it the genres you were listed in? Um, is it the writing? Maybe the writing is bad. And sometimes we as authors have to be willing to admit that. So you, you kind of have to look at your book as a case by case basis and then decide, okay, what do I need to do to tweak this book to get it where it should be? Nice. And if you were to say, do we change all those things all at once? Or is it a case that I need to do one at a time? And do I wait a certain period of time before I adjust other things? I know this isn't a great answer, but it depends. You have yeah. to decide when you're looking at the book, what can you afford? So like in the case of Deathless, yeah. I know that I need a full set of new covers, probably new titles, and yeah. probably some rewriting. It would take me several months of my life. And I have to ask myself, triage, is it worth doing that? Or should I be releasing new books during that same time period and making more money? And, and I've opted at this point to do that. So sometimes it's just best to kind of say, all right, I'll tweak a few things as long as it doesn't take too much time, effort, and money um, and you know, move forward hopefully after a while. So that, that kind of sucks every now and then because I know that I'm sure you're probably attached to your older books, those things that you've put a lot of time into. So, I mean, how does that feel that you got to kind of say, okay, I got to let this go and move forward? 
you, you know, it's tough. I, I will finish the Deathless series because I'm, I'm not going to leave fans hanging forever. That's just not fair in, in my opinion. Yeah. But I also have to balance when I publish those books. So it's, there's a little frustration there that certain series don't take off. Um, especially the ones that are, are are kind of you know from our heart and our, our brainchild that we've been working on for years. You know, we really want those to be successful, and if they're not, you know, you sort of got to take it right on the ego um, and admit the truth, and and that can be really hard. But if you want to be successful, sometimes you got to make a hard right in the genre that you're publishing. Otherwise, you're not making a living at this. Yes, uh, that's that's so true. Um, all right, so we've talked a little bit about covers, and of course. I think anybody can probably see right behind you. You actually have proof of those covers. They're just simply spectacular, very remarkable covers. How important are book covers? And um, you know, can authors simply make a good living from using Cover Creator or five dollar book covers, or you know, just any kind of free book templates that are out there? Um, in 2012, that would have worked. Today, yeah. you're up against the best authors in the world, and that's both indie and trad pub authors. They've got super professional covers, and this is every genre now, where even the smaller nonfiction genres you're starting to see uh, are raising quality. We're up against professionals, and so you sort of got to raise your A-game if you want to be successful, and that can be expensive. In, in some genres, you need um, original artwork like mine and it can run you up to a thousand dollars for a cover and others with nonfiction, you might be able to do it for like 75 bucks so it's really about finding the sweet spot in your genre and getting as efficient a cover as you can but you asked how important a cover is i'd, I'd say 60 percent of your overall success is the cover and of that um, most of the success is how does it look in a thumbnail because that's what people are seeing when they're browsing amazon and if the thumbnail is not enough to grab them, they never clicked on your, your link. So anything else that has to do with your book is totally irrelevant. Nice. Excellent advice. I just, that's one thing I noticed about, you know, your cover that just, just pops. It's one of those things that commands my attention. And wow, when you just said that price point, I'm sure everybody that's watching this probably went, oh, did he just say a thousand dollars? Yeah, I just booked um, Tom Edwards, who's one of the premier cover designers in the world. He's doing a few of mine for the current series. Yeah. Um, I just booked six covers for him. And yeah, it's a thousand bucks a pop and it is absolutely worth every penny. Excellent. So you see a recoup of that money investment um, you know, over the long haul, or is this something that you see instantaneously? Instantaneously, and in the case of Voidworm anyway. So the most recent release um, launched today with those 1300 pre-orders, that paid for the editing, the advertising, the cover, and has already put like 500 bucks in my pocket. That is nice. That is a good day. So you got to be feeling pretty good right now. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. So I've still got, you know, what, uh, 11 more hours. There's still some daylight now. <laughs> um, all right. So let's transition over to something. And I think with you having your expertise and the fact that I've just, you know, I've read through some of your books and I just, I, I know that I, I get a good sense that you have a firm grasp on the fundamentals of this business. What are the most common self-publishing mistakes that you see? And, you know, even if it's something to do with writing, uh, what can they avoid? Paralysis. Decision paralysis is the number one problem that authors face where wow. you want to do it perfectly the first time you release because we look at mistakes as being wrong or damaging in, in our culture. Yeah. Making mistakes is embarrassing. If you can convince yourself to take action, even if you occasionally stumble and make mistakes, you're going to be light years ahead of everybody else just through simple experimentation and a willingness to screw up. Boy, that's, that's really well put. I almost feel like we should have finished off on that one right there. Uh, analysis <laughs> paralysis is almost always something that I think that takes over me. And that's what ends up putting that editor in my way when I'm trying to do that, that, that you know, in the flow of thought when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, so um, here we go. We're going to transition over to something I'd like to ask all guests. And it is, given the choice, would you choose passion or profit. You got to choose one or the other, passion or profit, and why? I would choose, <laughs> this is a tough question. Yeah. I would choose profit for one reason and one reason only. Yeah. If I chose profit, I could make enough money to write for passion. Now, the goal should be to do both. I, I write for passion and I make a profit doing it. And I think that every author can do that if they push. Yeah. But if I'm at a stage in my career where I can't write for passion yet, I'm going to write for profit until I can afford to write for passion. I applaud you. That's an excellent, excellent answer. So ultimately, you've really built quite a name for yourself and you're really getting out there. And I'm, I'm telling you, you're everywhere at the same time for crying out loud. Uh, 
What do you ultimately want to be remembered for? My fiction. I, I didn't really ever intend to, to start teaching. Um, I didn't know that, you know, people were going to adopt this stuff. I certainly didn't expect this to sell like, you know, 75,000 books to writers um, and, and to get the volume of email that I do. But, you know, it, it's really nice to be able to help and to give back in a way that was lacking, I think, in my, my own development as a writer. You know, when I was 25, I couldn't find a mentor. I couldn't find anybody to help me. It didn't exist. And now being able to provide that to people, um, it's just surreal and humbling. There's a 14-year-old kid that I talk to on a very regular basis. He's brilliant, you can tell right away. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's got a lot of experience as a writer already, and I'm getting to mentor this kid across the globe. I don't even know where he lives. <laughs> nice. But that ability to reach out and, and touch people's lives is really nice. So right now I'm gonna say fiction, but you know, you ask me in five years, maybe it's nonfiction, I don't know. That's awesome, excellent. Hey, uh, how can our viewers find you? Uh, my central hub is chrisfoxwrites.com. That leads to my YouTube channel for authors, all the books that I've written, both nonfiction and fiction, and articles on uh, marketing and other random rumblings. <laughs> awesome. Very good. Hey, I really appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your day to uh, spend here with me. Um, you've, you've been a, been a hoot, and I certainly hope that some people actually reach out to you, your YouTube channel. Stellar, great video production. I'm definitely watching here. So in, in the meantime here, folks, if you have any kind of questions, please feel free to get a hold of him over on his website. Uh, the guy is very approachable. I was actually shocked. It's so funny when you consider somebody to be a bit of a rock star and they like, I'm like, oh, this guy got back to me. So reach out to Chris. He's an awesome guy. So in the meantime and in between time, if you enjoyed this video, share it with somebody into publishing too. Till later, it's been Self-Publishing with Dale. And I'll see you soon.